uh, preaching from John 12, 20 26, that's on page uh, 1671 and 72 in the Pew Bible. Actually, we started at verse 12 to get a little context. Now, the, uh, the context that this was written into culturally was the Greco Roman context, first century. And there was one reason that you did anything in the Greco Roman world, and that's glory. The reason that you wanted money wasn't for money itself, it was so that you could get glory for yourself. The reason that you wanted to be in like, like Caesar, even though they have particularly short lifespans, is so that you could get glory for you and your family. The reason they wanted it is because they had no real positive view of the afterlife. By all accounts, for them, the, the place of the dead was, was not, a, not a fun place to go. So while you're alive, you need to get all the glory you can so that your name, at least, will live on. It's into this context that John's Gospel is written, and he has a very different idea, especially what Jesus tells us in this passage about what it means to achieve glory. And in John's particular use of the word glory, glory refers to the crucifixion of Jesus. Now we're right at the hinge of the book. John is divided into two big sort of chunks. Chapters 1 through 11 is the book of signs. And there's a series of escalating signs ending with the raising of Lazarus. And then 12 through 21 is the book of glory, which really the only events in it are Jesus saying goodbye to everybody and then going to the cross and, of course, being raised. But we're right at the hinge, at the turning point, where it goes from the book of signs to the book of glory. John 12, we're going to begin at verse 12 and go through 26. The next day, the great crowd that had come up for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would convince us, convince our, our reluctant hearts. We don't want to follow you because you take us to difficult places. Please show us through your word and through your grace how we can follow Jesus. Amen. Sometimes... Your highest moment is actually your rock bottom. I want you guys to go back in time with me. About 13 years, September 1997, I'm walking down a long concrete hallway backstage at the Brent Event Center. You have no idea what the Brent Event Center is, that's okay. But in Orange County, California, which was my hometown, it was a big deal. It was one of the bigger venues, and, and on this particular night, it was sold out. 6,000 seats with thousands more turned away. And I can hear people talking excitedly through the walls, these big concrete walls. I had been working for this particular sort of night my whole life. Since I was 12 years old, all I had wanted was to play a concert like this one. The reason it was sold out on this night was my band was playing that I sang for. 
Our new record had come out, and we were, we were getting more popular than we knew what to do with. I was really ready for the payoff that night. And if my 12-year-old self could have seen what he was doing at 21, he would have said, awesome, it's totally sweet. He'd, I didn't have a headgear, but you know, that's kind of how 12-year-old troubles talk. <laughs> he would have said, I'm amazing. I'm a somebody. I must be really fulfilled. And probably out of 6,000 people, there's at least one girl that wants to make out later. Who's 12, you know? That's what 12-year-olds think about. <laughs> he would have said all those things and would have been completely wrong. I stepped on that stage that night ready for the, for the payoff. I had given myself to this one dream, to play a show just like this. And I felt completely dejected, alone, and disappointed afterwards. It didn't deliver. I'd given myself to it, and it disappointed utterly. I think everybody has had a moment like that, where something that you worked so hard for disappointed you. And if you don't, maybe you're working towards that thing right now. Working towards a degree. And when you get it, ooh, I'm going to be a somebody. A lot of us are seminary students. When I become a pastor like Greg Johnson, I'm going to be awesome. <laughs> Greg's saying no. He's backing me up. Some of you are working towards your doctorates. And when you get that thing, you're going to set the academic world on its ear, right? Some of you are looking for that person your soulmate. And when you find them, you will be truly fulfilled. Some of you have no idea what you could even work towards that would fulfill you. And we all want fulfillment. We're all looking for something like that, something to give ourselves to. But whatever it is, I'll save you the suspense. It's not going to deliver, no matter how good it is. So how does... Jesus, speak to this need, this, this really deep need that we have for fulfillment. He has a very different vision of how to become a somebody. Namely, it's to become a nobody. There's a fundamental motion to walking with God in, that, that we see in the New Testament. You have to give up to get. The way up is down. The way to glory is through the cross. To become a somebody, you must first become a nobody. Now, if Jesus were a rock star, the raising of Lazarus would have been his white album. It would have been his born in the USA, his exile on Main Street, his fame monster. Nobody got that. I'm proud of you guys. That's Lady Gaga. I was trying to trick you. <laughs> His no strings attached in sync fans were on His Rio, thank you. Now we're speaking my language. But after the raising of Lazarus in John 11, crowds came out to see Jesus wherever he went. They wanted to see the miracle worker. They wanted to see the guy who raised the guy and the guy he raised. But it wasn't just that. There was a buzz in the air that this could be the Messiah. Now to these people... These Jews in first century Palestine, Messiah did not mean the guy who was going to come and save us from our sins. It meant the guy who was going to come and save us from our Romans. They had a particular expectation that the Messiah was going to come to Jerusalem, take up David's crown as David's heir, and lead a successful revolution. And this guy, who has power over life and death, might be the guy. And so you see... Back in, uh, back in when they're welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem, they're saying, Hosanna! That means we pray you would save us. Welcome to the King of Israel. Right? They're saying, you're the one. Our hopes are on you. Jesus, you have to remember, he was fully human. He was a Jew who grew up under these circumstances, under the oppression of Rome. His whole life, he knew as he rode up that path to the city gate on that donkey. Throngs of people. Imagine it. People who were really old, who had lived their whole life under the Roman yoke. Finally, for the first time, 
have hope. Have hope that you're the one who's going who's to free them from oppression. And they heap honor and praise on him. But Jesus doesn't choose the crown. He doesn't choose the honor of a victorious king. He chooses the shame of the cross. How could he do that? How can he give up honor? Because honor is a, is a primary motivation in, in what we seek to, fulfill, to, to, to fill ourselves up with. We want, we work hard on our papers in school so that our professors, you know, pay us the honor of, of recognizing our brilliance. We work hard at our jobs so that we can get the honor of being competent at it. We write blogs and we want people to honor us and, and admire our wit, our taste. I don't know what you guys do with those things. I have a blog, not really. It's on Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> we, we seek to fill ourselves up. We're, we're motivated to get this honor that is ultimately going to disappoint us. But the honor of men is not only futile, it doesn't just, you know, it doesn't just fail to satisfy. It's also antithetical to following Jesus, because we see that Jesus rejects the honor of men. So how can we who need honor, who are motivated by honor, give it up? Well, I'd suggest that we don't give up honor. We upgrade. Look with me at verse 26. Jesus says, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. What's better than the honor of men? The honor of God himself. This is the promise of Jesus in this passage, that if you follow him, and that is to the cross, that is to shame, that is to rejecting men's honor, that you yourself, sitting right there, will be honored by God. It's not just our motivations that, that we, need, we need to switch from unfulfilling motivations, from empty motivations, but it's also what we're, what we're motivated to do, what we're actually pursuing. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I really like the show House. Sharon and I got into it, you know, after it went into syndication, like every show. We are about five years late on anything. But there was a really interesting story about one of the actors that came out last year. The actor's name is Cal Penn, but that's just his first name. His real name is not Cal Penn, it's Cal Penn Suresh Modi. And forgive my pronunciation, I realize I butchered that. Obviously, Cal Penn is an Indian American, and it was his lifelong goal to be a professional actor. And he obviously faced a big obstacle as an Indian American going into an industry where they didn't get good parts. And he kind of started out in these like lowbrow comedies and he got a, a guest starring spot on 24 as this teenage terrorist. Not really what he had in mind. But his dream finally came true. He, he realized his life's goal in 2007 when he ended up on House as Dr. Kuttner. Now House is a, is a prime time, critically acclaimed, sort of high quality drama and he got one of the biggest parts. He's an every week character. And it was a real surprise when he walked away from it in 2009. What could get this guy to walk away from his lifelong goal? Something he had worked so hard for, overcome so much for. A greater goal. He had gotten a call from the White House. President Obama wanted him to come and work in his cultural outreach department. And that was a goal that was even dearer to Cal Penn's heart. And so he, he left the big paycheck he left, he works behind the scenes at the White House now with very little recognition. But this goal that was bigger than him was, was, was dearer to his heart, and that was the only thing that could get him to walk away from, from, from his other goal. Now, 